Hi everyone, we're in the book room at the Royal Society. Now something you might not know about the Society is that it's responsible for the first ever scientific journal, which is 350 years old this year. It's called Philosophical Transactions, or Philtrans. And look, here are some of the early copies. We've got volume 80, we've got 63, 17, lower and lower. Look, here's number two. Number two is actually not in its proper binding. Its bindings come away a bit, so it's being protected in this box. But who cares about number two? What we want is number one. And that's where we're going now. We're going to meet the president of the Royal Society, a very famous scientist, Sir Paul Nurse, a Nobel Prize winner, and he's going to show us volume one of the world's first ever scientific journal. So this is Sir Paul's office. Let's go in and meet him. Hello, Brady. Hello. Now, this is Sir Paul but you have told me I am to call you Paul. You're dead right. I'm not being disrespectful. This is instructions from the man himself. So let's sit down here. First of all, first of all, can I ask about your office? This is my first time in your office. Magnificent office, isn't it? Do you have any favorite objects in here? Well, you know, all the paintings here are, of course, reproductions, because I can't afford any of the originals, but they're all mine. I put them in there, and if you look around, you see they all have a sort of scientific connection. So that's an astronomer up there from Vermeer. This is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's Lavoisier by David. And then you'll see a collection of paintings. We've got Newton, uh, painted by Blake. Then we have the uh, orrery from Wright of Derby. I actually wasn't going to ask you this, but you mm. forced me into it now. Mm. Walking around the Royal Society, I've seen portraits of all the presidents. Yeah. I have not seen a portrait of you yet. What's and you are coming towards the end of your term. What's happening with your portrait? I, I imagine that I'll have a portrait painted of me, but we haven't yet organised it. Okay. We're not here to talk about portraits no. of presidents. No. We're here to talk about this incredible thing here. We have volume one of... Can I call it Phil Trans? Yeah, you can. All right, we have volume one of Phil Trans. I'm going to take the gloves off. Normally I wear the white gloves, but handling paper this delicate, I'm not going to wear the gloves. You know, this is... Uh, what you are looking at here is one of the most magnificent artefacts of all science. What we're looking at here is the invention of scientific publishing. That was carried out by the Royal Society in 1665, just five years after its foundation. And what it essentially did is opened up constructive discourse into science. What this meant is you published it, Many, many people could read it. It was critically reviewed before it was accepted, so you don't just get pure nonsense. And that would engage other scientists and other people around the world to discuss this particular topic, to come up with alternative ideas, to be critical of it, to try and repeat it. And it really invented, in my view, modern science. I think it's worth looking at what is in the first edition. Yeah. We have an introduction, of course. Yeah, naturally. Then we have something about optic glass, which looks very interesting. Something where Mr. Hook has observed a spot in one of the belts of Jupiter. He even mentions here that he's seen the spot move from east to west over about half the length of the diameter of Jupiter. So he's seeing the spot moving. So something's going on here, which is, which is fascinating. And you know, you, you won't believe it. Jupiter is in the skies at this moment. And I also saw a spot moving across the face of Jupiter just last night from this very building though the telescope I have was much easier to use and much more um, effective than what um, poor old Robert Hooke had to use. Okay, then we have a, we have a rather long article here about uh, cometary... Comets, it looks like, Comet to me. motion, which is the, the longest article we have in here. Then we have what I understand is a bit of a review of Boyle's research into cold temperatures. Ah, uh, right. And then we have a lead ore, some mineral or something that's been found in Germany. We have something about pendulum watches and longitude, which is obviously, you know, really famous science going on there. This is basically an obituary, I think, for an MP who's died. <laughs> then we actually have something which is interesting. We have a, an article all about hunting whales or fishing for whales in the West Indies. Off, and Off the Bermudas, it yeah, says. Yeah, killing yeah. whales and getting the oil, yeah, yeah. which is... Not, not so politically correct these days, I would imagine, but anyway, it's another time. They weren't always politically correct in 1665, no, no, no. at least from our perspective. This is another one which is famously in the first volume, an account of an odd monstrous car. Ah, yes, I know about this, yeah, yeah. So, what, so what's happened here? It sounds to me as though a local butcher has found some kind of deformed calf, as sometimes happens, and the scientists have gone and had a look at it and read a little summary of what they saw. 
what was so interesting about these times is that for curious people who were just rationally looking at nature, everything out there, or almost everything, was there to be discovered. What they simply needed to apply was their curiosity, and they found something. Do you envy them? I mean, these days scientists have to be so specialised. Do you know specialized. I do envy them? I sometimes think I, well, for certain purposes, would have been much better in the second half of the 17th century, because I am interested in lots of things. I'm driven by my curiosity. I can't control myself, really. I just want to know how things work. And being rather more specialised and focusing on what I do, which I love, is sort of a little bit more limiting than what these great early proto-scientists uh, were doing um, in the 17th century at the foundation of the Royal Society. So we mentioned in volume one, there's this really long article about cometary, cometary motion, the motion of comets, I don't know how to say it, <laughs> all about comets. So this is a letter written by the famous astronomer Cassini. Ah, yes. And he's written this shortly before publication of volume one. And it's all about comets, and we can see here, I, I'm, we're making a few assumptions here, but it seems very likely that this letter from Cassini has informed what then gets published. Cassini, as you say, famous astronomer, using these simple crude telescopes, he saw what's called Cassini's gap in the rings of Saturn. Yeah. So if you look at Saturn, you can look at that later in the year, yeah. you will see a, a gap in the rings, and that's named after Cassini. There's one more thing I'd really like to show you yeah. and, and everyone else. So this is an example of a letter that's kind of a precursor of to, the, to, to publication. Of the first journal, yeah. But the thing, the thing that excites me even more yes. is this one here. Are you a very excitable person, though? I, when it comes to the Royal Society archives, I get very excited. <laughs> careful. I'll be careful. Keith I'll be will careful. be on to you. Yeah, Keith's watching. Now, this has been written shortly after publication of Volume 1, and I'm not even going to pretend I can read it. It's probably in Latin. It's in 1665. It's in 1665. But you can see here, he's mentioning Mr. Hook. Now, we saw here in Volume 1 that Hook had observed this spot. This spot on the face of Jupiter, yeah. He's mentioned Hook, and then he's included this oh, picture. Look at that. He's obviously read what was in Volume 1, gotten excited, gone to look for himself and seen the same thing, and then written a letter saying, oh, I saw it too. This is quite exciting. This is like, this is... Well, this is, this is really showing science working. The point is, Hook reports this, okay? Now, did he make it up? Did he have an aberration in his telescope so he couldn't see it? Did he have a spot in his eye, okay? Until somebody else has seen it, has reproduced it, you can't be sure of that. But you see the principle, it's by publishing here, you are stimulating debate, stimulating more observation, and the science becomes that bit more secure. Phil Trans is still going? It's amazing, it is. It's such, of course, old-fashioned name. I don't think we should change it because of this heritage, I have to say. It connects us to those early scientists. It connects us, frankly, to the birth of modern science. Is any of this stuff ever a, a source of embarrassment or do you sort of cringe a little bit when you look at this early science or is it so long ago you just sort of sit back and... No, I just admire them for trying to do what they could do with what they had available. 